All right, so in this video, we're gonna talk about some theory and how the Riemann sum relates to the definite integral. So the area under the curve, I assume that F is continuous on A to B, okay, which it happens to be for this picture, closed interval A to B, and the interval, okay, so we're talking about everything from here to here, area under the curve is this area right here between the graph of F and the x-axis. So what we're gonna do with this interval is we're gonna partition it, which that's a fancy way of saying we're gonna divide it up, we're gonna cut it up. And the reason we're gonna cut it up is because we're gonna make individual rectangles that are going to be Riemann sums that add up the area under the curve. Okay, so I want to divide it up so that I start at A and I end at B. All right, so I'm going to start with an A equal to X1. So that's my first A value. So A is equal to X1. So that's where I'm starting right there. The next value I'm going to have is an X2. So I'm going to put an X2 right next to it. All right, so a, X1, X2. And so I have my first little rectangle that's formed there. And then I have a bunch of little itty bitty ones in here. And that's in my dot dot dots right there. Okay, so don't pay too much attention to the scale of this here. I only put the separation here so that you could actually see it. So um, if there's infinitely many down in here, you just can't even see it, right? So. The dot, dot, dots kind of handle all of those um, XI's in there. So I have some arbitrary XI here where I could be um, any number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out to however high uh, the number of rectangles I have. And then I plus one, or X sub I plus one is just the next one after that, okay? And then it goes all the way up to x to the n, or x sub n. And the last one is x sub n plus 1. So um, we start at x1, and that's my a. That's where I started. And we end at x n plus 1, and that's my b. Okay, so if you, if you think about it with a simple example, um, say I was going to do uh, three rectangles, to approximate the area under the curve. Okay, that's n, that's n equal to three, right? But there's x1, x2, x3, and x4. So that's why you have the n plus one, right? Because that right there is the x n plus one, where n is equal to three gets you the x sub four, okay? So that's why you have that x sub n plus 1 going on there. Now, the i sub interval from xi to xi plus 1 has a width. And look, so this is the i -th interval. So that's the i -th interval. Now, how do I find the width of that interval? I do right minus left. So xi plus 1 minus xi will get this for me. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to define this, and I'm going to use this later, but I'm going to define ci to just be some number in this sub-interval, this sub i -th interval. Okay, so... It could be in the dead center, it could be over here on the left, it could be on the right. All we know is that it's somewhere in between those two, inclusive, all right? So if there are n subintervals and they are equally spaced, so that's the key, they're all equally spaced, meaning like I took my interval from A to B, and it's like boom, 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 boom. Every one of them maybe is a distance of 2.5 between each one. So every delta x 
every width is exactly equally spaced, okay? A partition just means to divide it up. So you could have a partition where I divide it like this and then I have a big old gap and then I do some little ones and then a gap there. That is a partition. We divided this interval up into several pieces, but they are not equally spaced pieces. So there's a difference there. So I have um, n equally spaced subintervals, then x, uh, then delta x sub i is equal to exactly delta x, which is the same, they're equally spaced. And if you'll recall from another video, to find the width of a subinterval, I take how long the total interval is from a to b, so I do b minus a, and I divide by how many rectangles I wanna make. So I divide by n. Okay, so xi is defined to be what? It's defined to be a, all right? So to get this xi value, I have to have a starting point. That's my a, okay? So I have to have some starting point on the line. So from a to b, to get some random xi, I start at a, okay, and then I add, well, what do I add? Whatever my width is, my delta x, I add that one, two, three, four, five times, right? But this would be if that was um, I my, or, or four, okay, so, or five, I guess. No, I guess it'd be six, wouldn't it? That'd be x sub 6, right? So what's going on here? This xi is equal to a time, and plus um, i minus 1 times delta x. So the width of each of these little rectangles multiplied by how many rectangles you're adding to get to that ith position there, and then plus your a gets you that ith position, all right? So if, you have, if you're looking for x4, then you do a plus and then four minus one delta x, and so that'd be a plus three times delta x. So you think about that picture, the simple one, two, and then three rectangles, so that'd be x1, x2, x3, and x4. Well, how do I get to x4? Well, I start at a, okay? I start at a, and then I add three delta x's. One, two, three, and then that gets me to x4. So that's how, that's how it works here. That's the formula used right there for you. Okay, so using this formula in action here, for x1, if I plug a 1 into my formula, I have a plus 1 minus 1 delta x, because I plugged in a 1 for the i, okay? But 1 minus 1 is 0, so this term right here just goes away, so I'm just left with x1 equal to a which is exactly what I want it to be defined as. But what about this xn plus one? I want it to be equal to b. So I plug in an n plus one for i. So that's everywhere I have an i, I plug in an n plus one. So I plug to n plus one, but then I need to minus one delta x. So this is x, uh, I'm sorry, x sub n plus one equals a plus n times delta x, okay, n times delta x. So we gotta remember what is delta x? Well, we define delta x to be equal to b minus a over n. So what does that do for us? That actually makes this n and that n cancel. So I get a plus b minus a, and then those a's cancel and I just get b. So everything works out how it's supposed to. X sub n plus one is B, and 
x1 is a, just like we're supposed to have, okay? So this formula is key for you, helping you figure out that xi value. Now, what is a and b? a is that, is that lower um, limit of integration, and b is the upper limit of integration. So when you're going through these problems, those are the numbers you're looking for your a and your b now f the then what does this tell me the integral the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx is approximately equal to the riemann sum from i equal one to n okay of f of c so ci is going to be some value but in the sub interval don't care which value it is. All we know is we pick something that's in the subinterval. The reason it doesn't really matter is because we're making these rectangles so small that if you just pick something in the subinterval, it's just like picking something else in the subinterval. Okay? It's so close, it's so small that that all we need is just something in the subinterval. Okay? So whether it's a left-hand rule or a right-hand rule. Or a midpoint rule would be like xi plus xi plus 1 divided by 2. That would be in between these two values. So this is just saying that it can be left-hand rule, right-hand rule, anything in between those, and we're still okay. Times your delta xi, which is right here, and it's all equal to delta x. Bless me. Okay, uh, if the sub intervals are equal to each other. So, what does this say? I've got n rectangles, so an arbitrary number of rectangles, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, blah, 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 n of them, n total rectangles with heights equal to what? The function evaluated at that point, the height is f of ci for that particular ith interval and with delta uh, x sub i where this is found by just taking the right endpoint minus the left sub sub interval endpoint so right now what we have is this is approximately equal because n is finite i have some fixed number of rectangles maybe 20 rectangles now I want to know, how do I make it equal? This is where we tie in what we learned in the first day, second day, third day of class, when we started talking about limits. And I told you, all of this is related back to limits and why limits is so important, because limits are the foundation of derivatives. They're the foundation of integration. They're the foundation of all of calculus, is this idea of taking a limit some theoretical concept that puts abstract thought into real practice. And so I take the limit as n goes to infinity of the series from one, i equal 1 to n. So I push it out from a fixed finite amount to a limit as n goes to infinity. So I'm getting infinitely many rectangles. And I'm summing them all up by multiplying the height times its base, corresponding base, getting the area, that's what a Riemann sum is. It's a, it's a height times a base of a rectangle and I add them all up and I take the limit as n goes to infinity. And when I do that, that is equal to the definite integral from a to b f of x dx. Pretty cool stuff here, that's the Riemann sum, okay? This is the definition for the left-hand sum. It's equal as long as I push n out to infinity. This is the same definition, but it's for the right-hand sum. As long as I push n out to infinity, it's equal. This is the definition for the midpoint. The midpoint sum, as long as I push n out to infinity. So all these are equal to the Riemann sum, which is equal to the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx. All right, so once again, this is the theory 
behind why integration works, okay? In calculus, every, every time we go through, it's like we take a very complicated idea and we turn it into lots of lots of lots of little simple ideas and put them together, right? So like with, with area, we can't find the area of this complicated shape, so we approximate by making these rectangles, which we know how to find the area of, and that gets you a good approximation. Just like we, when we were trying to find derivatives, we couldn't find the derivative at an exact point, but if we took a secant line, we could find the slope of that secant line. An Algebra 1 student could find that slope, right? And then the closer and closer I bring in the um, value, so let me, let me pull this out. So like if this, this was the derivative I was trying to approximate, right? So, um, let me put this in here. Okay, so the closer and closer that I pull this x value inward, the closer and closer you see that the, the derivative line is getting to the actual tangent line. So all you have to do is pull in your x value closer and closer and you get better and better approximations, all right? So it's the same thing. I'm taking that limit as h goes to zero, that horizontal distance, right? So that distance was shrinking and that limit going to zero, just like technically we're limiting our delta x's to go to zero. If the widths are shrinking, the smaller and smaller these rectangles get the more and more and better and better the approximation becomes, okay?